If you would, please turn to the second epistle of Timothy. We'll look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us, and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause also I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's where I'm going to try and preach from. I will say this. I have nothing new today. Absolutely nothing new. However, I do have something old. Older than this world. Because by God's grace, I'm here to preach whom I have believed and whom I think Paul has believed. I try to do it every time. But the whom in this scripture in particular, but also in every scripture, is the most important thing. Whether I see it or not. Whether you see it or not. The whom is the important thing. There are a lot of people tied up in what? They're tied up in doctrine. They're tied up in tradition. They're tied up in denomination. They could be tied to a church building. They love the what. But most places leave out the whom. And the what is important. Doctrine is important. Sound teaching is important. But the what better be based on the who. Because it's Christ that leads us to his doctrine. It's not doctrine that leads us to Christ. A lot of people got it backwards. And that's the most, the whom is always the most important thing. When it's him. When it's him. Because what you know is dependent upon who you know. And it will leak out. It has. I will tell you this. I wrote it down. Correct doctrine with Christ, with, excuse me, correct doctrine without Christ is just as dead as false doctrine without Christ. Because the key thing is you're without Christ. You have to know, and I'm going to try and prove this from this scripture. You have to know the true Jesus Christ. Or you are without Christ. Romans 10 and verse 13, just for a second, before I get really into this, just to show you what I'm talking about. Romans 10 and verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. How shall they then, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? You can't believe who you don't know. That's just the way it is. There are people around who will accuse us of blind faith. Paul says it here. I know. I know whom I have believed. Here's the thing. You may not know whom I've believed, but I know whom I've believed. That's what Paul's saying. In 1 John, you know, we went through this. It proudly proclaims and graciously proclaims that we know what? That we know him. Now, the encouragement of the assembly, the encouragement of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is important. It's essential and it's welcome. However, there is this one little point. There is no assembly unless there are individuals making up that assembly. Paul's saying, I know. I know. This is his testimony to Timothy. He wrote him a letter, but it's to us also. I know whom I have believed. There's no such thing as a group salvation. There's no such thing as a denominational knowledge. Not in the scriptures. There is no church salvation. Paul knew that he believed. And he knew whom he believed. Because no one could believe for him. I can't believe for you. You can't believe for me. I can't know for you. You can't know for me. I have to know whom I have believed, and you have to know whom you have believed. It is an individual thing, and it comes upon, and it comes to every child of God whom what? whom he has saved and called with a holy calling. It is called the common faith. But the only reason it's called the common faith is because every single child of God believes him and will believe him. All I'm saying is, you have to know. And you have to know him. We'll get into that. So it's individual. But there's another thing about this that I have to point out because this is also true. The scriptures are clear, Apostle Paul in particular. It takes the power of God to know and to believe the true and living God. To know Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Verse 9, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, what? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God saved us, not according to our works. That past, present, or future. Take one. Pick one. You understand? There's a lot of people saying God chose us because he saw what we would do. No. God saved us not according to our works. Thank God he saved us not according to our works. Because if it was dependent upon my works, I'd still be on my way to hell. And so would every one of you. He saved us according to his purpose. What? And his grace and his purpose and his grace was given to us in his son in Jesus Christ before the world began you know the word election is only in the Bible about six times but by golly it teaches it everywhere he gave us purpose and grace before the world was how can he do that? Well, he's God. 
He can do whatever he wants. And guess what? Paul just wrote it down. This is what he wanted to do, is to give his purpose and his grace to his children before the world ever was. You understand, people have a tendency to look at an election like it's leaving somebody out. No, it's the only way we could get included in. We were talking about that last Saturday with Roland and Walter. Election is not including anyone out. It's not putting anyone out. It puts somebody in. Otherwise, there would have been no one in. If God didn't choose us from before the foundation of the world, no one would have been saved because all were sinners in Adam. We were made sinners in Adam. Adam fell and we all fell with him. And this earth was cursed. And guess what? This earth is still cursed. Now there's coming a day that curse is going to be cleaned. And this earth is going to be cleansed but it ain't yet it's not yet God saved us here's the second thing in Colossians chapter 1 because this is something the world doesn't understand and to be honest I think some grace people may not have a grasp on and I do want to point this out <coughs> excuse me in Colossians 1 and verse 25 Paul writing, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And here we are. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. This is something, it's a mystery. Now, I'm not talking about the mystery of the church. That's a mystery also. Paul deals with that in another place. But this is a mystery. But it's been revealed to us. It's been revealed to those who know whom they have believed. What's this mystery? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. So what is it? Which is Christ in you? The hope of glory. Understand? I know whom I have believed is to know this mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ is a mystery to the world. He was a mystery to you at one time. Whether you thought you knew him or not. Whether even if you had correct doctrine or not. But until he reveals himself to his people, you're not going to know anything truly about Christ in you, the hope of glory, until what? He's in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is the mystery made known unto his saints. I like that. Christ in you, the hope. That's my hope of glory. He's my hope of glory that he's in me he gave us his spirit God himself living abiding in you if he saved you and called you by his grace but that's a mystery to the world what did Paul write in another place if our gospel be hid and it is it is hid to those that are lost. You mean the gospel is a mystery? To the world. To the world it is. But it's been revealed to his saints. Jesus Christ has been revealed to his saints. Or they're not saints. I mean, you know, how, how plain can you be? Our gospel is hid to the lost. What's that mean? It means that without Jesus Christ, that mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is unbelievable. You understand that? I mean, that I mean, it just hit me. 
It's unbelievable, Walker. The mystery of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is unbelievable to the world. Now, the problem's not with the mystery. The problem's not with the gospel. The problem is the world. The problem is the people in the world. The problem used to be me. It used to be me. There's one time I couldn't believe Christ. You know why? Because I didn't know Christ. I couldn't love Christ. And the only reason people can't love Christ is because they don't know him. They don't know who he is. They don't know what he did. They don't know where he is. And they don't know what he's doing now. Now, there's lies in all kinds of churches, in all kinds of places all over this world about where Jesus is, what he did, and what he's doing now. But this is the Christ of the Bible that we're trying to talk about today. I know whom I have believed. And Paul tells us whom. Paul tells us whom. Because Paul knew him. Paul said, I knew him. I know him. I know him. What's he say? Okay. Because we got to get to the whom. You got to know whom. And you got to know the right whom because the wrong whom can't help you. But Paul tells us in this scripture that I read today, first, first description here in verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of who? Our Lord. And then read on. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So who's the whom that Paul's talking about? A, he's our Lord, and B, he's God. Okay? Keep going. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us where? In Christ Jesus. We've got Lord, our Lord, God, and Christ Jesus. And who's left? The same whom? But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's whom Paul is talking about. Lord, our Lord, God, Christ Jesus, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that just the most peculiar order you ever heard? No, it's not if you know him. But it's peculiar to the world because you're starting from the wrong place according to the world. You just got to get people saved. Let them believe on Jesus. Paul starts with Lord. I didn't read it. But guess what it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9? That if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that's exactly right. That's exactly true. Ephesians 1 and 19 says, And what the exceeding greatness of his power to us who are believing according to the working of the power of his might. If you confess him, the Lord Jesus, with your mouth, it's because God has put his power in you to believe him, to know him, and to believe him. Because you can't believe who you don't know. But here it is. This is the whom. Our Lord, God, Christ Jesus, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't think he put one word of that in, out of order. I think it's all right there exactly where he wanted it to be. Because I remember Earl told, telling me a story, and I think he told it from the pulpit, about being in an ordination panel. He was on the panel. Him and a friend of his was there. And there was a young man, 
And the fellow who was with Earl asked the question. Or no, I'm sorry. Yeah, the fellow who was with Earl asked the young man the question. He asked him, who is Jesus Christ? Now this is a fellow, a young man. I don't know his name. Doesn't really matter. Because this fellow is being ordained as a preacher to be preaching the Lord Jesus Christ to people. And this fellow with Earl asked the question, who is Jesus Christ? And the young man answered and said, I don't understand the question. And when Earl first told me that story, I just went, I mean, my jaw dropped. If it didn't, it felt like it dropped. But I just felt, I felt amazed that this fellow here wanting to be a preacher, being ordained, has got to that point. You don't just ordain a guy the first week he shows up. Can't answer the question, doesn't understand the question, who is Jesus Christ? Well, guess what? The world doesn't understand that question. Not truly. Not truly. And the world today still doesn't understand that question or the answer to it. Because Paul answered that question right here. He is our Lord. He is God. He is Christ Jesus. And he is our Savior, Jesus Christ. And if that young man had said that, I thought at least he knew something. My goodness. Because not knowing who Jesus of Nazareth is means that you do not know him. Isaiah prophesied is coming. There's a child that's going to be born. There's a son that's going to be given. And he's going to be called what? The mighty God, the everlasting Father. The son that's going to be given is going to be called the everlasting Father. He's three or one. I ain't got no explanation. That's just the way it is. That's what it says. Father, Son, and Spirit. These three are one. You know what that means? It means these three are one. The great deeper meaning. What's Paul saying? You have to know the Lord. You have to know God. You have to know Christ Jesus. And you have to know our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's not four different people. It's the same guy. But we have to divvy it up in order to get any of it in our head. The Lord. Paul just wrote it here across the page here in chapter 6 and verse 15. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. The king of kings and Lord of lords who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And John wrote of him coming, saying it's on his vesture and it's on his thigh. What? King of kings and Lord of lords. You've got to know the Lord. Oh, and he's God. Isaiah prophet, the mighty God, the creator and the sustainer of everything and everyone in this universe. It takes the power of God to believe this one. It takes his power to believe him. The world doesn't know anything about that. And I'm going to tell you this, 99% of preachers don't know anything about that because they're not preaching it. Understand, salvation, the knowledge of God, believing Jesus Christ, takes a miracle in a man or a woman. It takes the power of God. It's, it's, it, it's written in black and white. All over the place. In many different ways. But they won't have it because it doesn't fit their wheelhouse. It doesn't fit in their scheme. It's not part of their tradition. 
and they won't submit themselves to Christ, and they won't even submit themselves to the Word. They'll tell you they believe every word in the Bible until you read it to them, until you tell them what it says. Well, I'll believe that. Or that doesn't mean that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's my, been my personal experience. I'm being sarcastic now, okay? You know, the Bible never says what it means. That's what I hear. Because there's all kind of people explaining all kinds of things away. And there's all kind of other people that completely stay away from the good stuff, as far as I'm concerned. Not only is he God, he's Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, the prophesied one, all through the Old Testament. He's the blessed redeemer, he's the Passover lamb, and he is the continual burnt offering. He's the atonement. He's the atonement. He's the sacrifice goat, and he is the scapegoat. I like that. He's the Christ, Jesus, and he's our Savior, Jesus Christ. You notice Paul doesn't get to the Savior until he's gone through the Lord, the God, and the Christ. Because you know what? Your Savior's got to be all three of those. Your Savior has got to be Lord. Because salvation is of the Lord. Your salvation has got to be God because it takes his mighty power. And your salvation has to be the Christ because he's the one that came and purchased you with his own blood. And took away the sin of the world. Then... You get to the Savior. They start with the Savior and want to back up to the Lord. He don't work that way. Man works that way all the time. And they do. They, I mean, you know, seriously. They talk like believing Jesus is easy. Now let's go do something hard. Like, oh, oh walking good works. Well, walking in good works is hard. But you understand, you've got to know the Lord. <laughs> before he'll be your savior. He's going to show you who's boss, if you want to put it that way. And he's going to show you that it ain't you. It's not me. It's not Walter. It's not anybody. He's the one in charge. Because Jesus Christ is our savior, not only he bought us, not only he died for us, not only redeemed us, he reconciled us to God. That's salvation. You understand? He has brought us in himself to God, the Father. He's salvation from beginning to end. Alpha and Omega. And Paul said, I know whom I have believed. I have to believe him. I have to. You have to believe him. You have to know him. Or you don't. You don't know him, you don't believe him. You don't believe him, you don't know him. You can put whatever cart before the horse you want to on that one. Because if you don't know him, the Lord, God, Christ Jesus, and our Savior Jesus Christ... You ain't believing him. I'm trying to preach today of the one that whom I have believed. Because I know, I know this. He's the same one to whom all the prophets gave witness. I know this one. Our Lord, God, Christ Jesus, and our Savior Jesus Christ is the very same one that all the apostles gave witness to. And I know he's here in his word, he's in his book, and he's in his assembly right now. I believe him. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I committed unto this day. How can Paul be so sure? 
How can you be so sure of salvation? You know people lose it and gain it all the time. All around us. No, they don't. But they say they do. People say lots of things, Walter. They ain't true. Because I'm going to tell you. You understand? When you're dealing with the Lord, God, Christ Jesus, and our Savior Jesus Christ, he's the one that saved us and called us. Right. And if you're saying he ain't able to keep, you're talking contrary to Scripture. Which, what's that mean? That means you're lying. You're lying. Because he's able. He's able. He that has begun a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Christ. Until that day. Until his day. He'll keep his sheep because he's a good shepherd. He'll keep his brothers and sisters because he's brought us into the family. And he'll keep, he'll keep his saints because he loved them and he'll love them to the end. He's our mystery. Reveal to his saints Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now listen, you didn't put him in you and you can't run him out. Come on now. <laughs> We're talking about the Lord. We're talking about God. We're talking about the Messiah, Jesus. We're talking about our Savior, Jesus Christ. He put himself in you. He revealed it to you. And you can't put him out. If God be for us, who can be against us? Not even yourself. So here's the question I have to ask. Do you know... Whom you have believed. Now I'm not asking who your parents believe. Who your grandparents believe. Your husband, your wife, or even what your children believe. Because this is one. This is a matter. It has to be settled. By each and every one of us. Myself included. Pastors, preachers, elders are not exempt. Walter has to know whom he has believed just as well as I have to know whom I have believed. But the question I'm asking is, do you know? Because you need to know whom you have believed. You must know Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because he's revealed it in his word. Like I said, knowledge doesn't save. Okay? Jesus, yes, Jesus Christ does save sinners. He saves the ungodly. He saves the unrighteous. He saves those who are enemies of God in their own minds. And also this. He saves the ignorant. But he doesn't leave us anywhere in that pile. Because that was a pile. That's a mess. Paul admitted, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. What? Was consenting under the stoning of Stephen? Was going to Damascus to put Believers in jail. Take them back to Jerusalem. Maybe get them stoned like Stephen was. I don't know. But he said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But here's the thing. He forgives our sins. And we're godly and we're righteous in him. And he calls us brethren now, not enemies. We always were brethren. We just didn't know it. And we no longer live. In sin. He lives in us. Not saying we don't sin. But we don't live in it. Anymore like we used to. But here's the thing. Believers. Are no longer ignorant. He saves us ignorant. But he shows you a few things. Before you even know about it. Believers. Know whom they have believed. And that's all I'm asking, do you? Our Heavenly Father, oh, Lord, help us. Because we know there's still ignorance in us. And we also know knowledge doesn't save us. But thank you for what you've given us and enabled us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Be with Walter as he comes to preach your word. Give him the words to speak and us the ears to hear and a heart to understand your will and your way by the power of your Son. Thank you, Lord. Amen.